heritage centres such as museums, archives and galleries are seen as highly valued cultural assets. In communities they offer spaces of learning and socialising whilst also preserving and securing the local sense of place through its historic connections. In this short documentary we'll be taking a journey, seeing how heritage centres go about encouraging community interaction and how such community interaction benefits the heritage centres themselves. Welcome to Isaac Clapham Presents Heritage Centres and their Community Interactions. Before we begin, it is important to clarify what a community is. A community can be any group with a mutual interest. For example, a community of family tree researchers or a community of people who all live in the same place. It can be a very niche or very expansive group, allowing for heritage centres to interact on many different levels. Funding within the heritage sector is a heavily discussed issue. Without funding, it's hard to reach out to communities. It's suggested that many national lottery heritage funding opportunities are unequally distributed to the more affluent areas over the poorer ones. When it comes to funding, the National Lottery Heritage Fund site says, From historic buildings, our industrial legacy and the natural environment, to collections, traditions, stories and more, heritage can be anything from the past that you value and want to pass on to future generations. The Heritage Fund can offer between £3,000 to £5 million for heritage projects. Since 1994, they have awarded £560 million to nearly 27,200 community-based projects across the UK. Their funding can even help communities with research and investigations, archival work and even public displays and events. After the effects of COVID-19, people began to become more connected to their local heritage and get more involved in their communities as a way to escape and return to the outside world. As lockdown was gradually released, People used heritage sites as a way of reunion, sociality and escape. The universities of Southampton, Cambridge and Surrey noticed this and with support from Historic England and the Heritage Alliance, they investigated why heritage appears as a joyful space at a time of national crisis and how heritage sites contribute to well-being and resilience. The findings of this research showed that single visits to heritage sites had a clear subjective well-being effect in increasing happiness and reducing anxiety. A key factor in this is that heritage sites were a managed safe space, giving people the confidence to leave their homes as the pandemic eased. This therefore suggests a strong sense of community is present for heritage organisations to tap into. Pop-up cultural exhibitions are a fresh and interesting way of doing this, with them appearing throughout the United Kingdom and the world. Deborah Mulhern's article, popping up near you in the February 2020 edition of the Museum's Journal, describes the idea of pop-up exhibitions. She says they are found in all manner of unexpected places, including libraries, supermarkets, pubs and food banks, but mostly found in empty high street shops and shopping centre units. Museum displays, exhibitions and events, mostly related to local history, have appeared in shopping centres from Bristol to Kendall to Leeds. For some, it is part of their outreach programme, and for others, it is to increase awareness of and access to the thousands of objects held in museum stores. They are places where local history gets a spotlight aimed at local people. For example, there was a pop-up exhibition on the fifth floor of a House of Fraser in Plymouth. There, Plymouth Museums, Galleries and Archives held a pop-up exhibition on the World War II Blitz. In Mulhern's article, she interviews Adam Milford, the Senior Engagement Officer and Learning Officer at The Box, Plymouth's new major heritage centre with museum, gallery and archive. He says, Being in a commercial space really boosted footfall and the pop-up gave us a chance to access and make use of collections such as on the schematics. The relationship we built with House of Fraser means we can hold further pop-up shops and the old children's department has been offered as a community hub. As well, pop-up exhibitions can go on the move. Mulhern describes how The Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge has been delivering pop-up museums about ancient Egyptian coffins across Cambridgeshire, taking the coffins to pubs, shopping centres, markets, a food bank and furniture store, reaching communities in areas of low social and cultural deprivation and affecting many people who work in trades using similar tools to the Egyptians. So it is clear to see 
that pop-ups are a successful way for heritage centres to interact with different areas of the community that they might not normally interact with. Mulhern concludes with a similar view, suggesting that the empty spaces in our high streets provide museums with fresh opportunities to reach new audiences in interesting and unusual spaces. Another heritage centre that encourages strong community relations are archives. As well as keeping the records and displaying the records, they help inform the public and can also host and run events in their communities. The National Archives believes that community engagement and good relations between archives and the public is vital for positive results and a sense of local ownership. This in turn should correlate with an improved service and an increased satisfaction. Cumbria Archive Service held an open day at their Carlisle location in November 2022. I talked to Kelda Rowe, an archivist with the Cumbria Archive Service, about the creation and benefits of the open day and what it achieved. How was the idea of an open day created? So the archives were celebrating their 60th anniversary last year as a service. One of the suggestions that one of the archive staff came up with was to have a local history fair. I think the motivation behind this was that archive service had been closed for a long period during the COVID pandemic and there are a lot of connections at risk of fading away and an open day seemed like a good idea of bringing those groups back together, rebuilding relationships and having a fresh start. The idea was also developed by other members of the archive team to add in interest for people who might not just be interested in studying local history or coming in to do archival research. We did some activities with people who had a general interest or specific interest in some areas. So we put on a series of talks on different subjects relating to Cumbria, which were supported by a number of academics who had done research in the archives here. We put on some children's activities in the Victorian kitchen, so some colouring activities, some activities relating to looking at documents, and some things that came from our school sources already. We put on some refreshments so it was a nice day out for people and put on some behind the scenes tours as well because we find that those are always popular. How enthusiastic of a response did you get to the idea? Within the service everyone pulled together to try and make things happen. Everybody got involved and people from the other offices came on the day to help ensure everything ran smoothly. Externally we got a pretty enthusiastic response within the council People were keen to help us promote it and 22 organisations came to join in the local history fair. There was 270 visitors total, including storeholders who are some of our target audience. The feedback was really good, generally a lot of positive comments. I hope people would like more events. Has it increased visitor numbers and made more people aware of the archive's location and services? Yes, I think it has. We have had people come in who have registered for an archive card and said, oh, I came to the open day, so I thought I'd give it a go. And we did have people who came on the day because they heard about it on the local news the night before. They didn't really know what we were here, so that was a good immediate local community engagement. It is clear to see that community engagement has increased opportunities available to the Cumbria Archive team. With the success of the open day, they brought all their groups back together and welcomed them into their archive community. Throughout this film, we've investigated many different examples of heritage centres and their various impacts on their local communities through their outreach programmes. Whether it is through a pop-up exhibition in a local pub or through community open days at centres' place of operation, heritage centres have little holding them back when it comes to community interactions. Although it is important to note how crucial funding is when attempting to interact with the community, Certain projects are more likely to get more funding than others, uh, whether that is down to location, services or interests, especially when considering council-run operations, such as the archives, who have less money available to them. However, that does not stop them, as shown through the Cumbria Archives' successful Open Day. They have managed to increase their visitor numbers and more people have become aware of their location and services. Through the study on heritage sites' purpose in well-being after COVID, it is clear to see how these places are important for happiness and reducing anxiety, as well as crucial community meeting points. From what we have seen, I suggest that an indirect form of community interaction, such as pop-ups, help encourage community interaction with heritage, whereas more direct forms of community interaction, like an open day, help heritage centres benefit for increased interactions. This just shows how successful heritage centres are in engaging themselves with their communities through both direct and indirect methods 
of engagement, they increase their footfall, funding, services, and the happiness of the community to allow for such heritage to be enjoyed for many generations to come. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.